between my eyes What do the find? Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach if you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps serve service professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, dentists, coaches, stop just trading time for dollars and shift from one-to-one client work to -to one-to-many. Actually, today's interview is going to talk about just that with newsletters and how they can do that. But Rise25 is an exclusive accountability and group coaching program for professional services entrepreneurs who want to scale up and stop just trading time for dollars. It was founded by my business partner, John Corcoran, and myself, where we bring together like-minded entrepreneurs from different client-serving backgrounds. Go to, go to rise25.com and you can learn more about us and download our free dream product ladder so you can discover what untapped revenue you have in your business. It's rise25.com. Today, I'm very excited. Along awaited, we have Sean Buck, founder of Newsletter Pro. They send out millions of newsletters per year for their customers. He's built a multi million dollar business crafting customized newsletters for his clients which help them do all the right things, right, Sean? Increase retention, get more referrals, get more new clients. And the best thing is it's hands off. So they print it and they mail it and they put it together in house. They made the Inc. 500, 5,000 fastest growing companies two years in a row with a growth rate of 2,975%. Most impressive part, Sean, is you are the father to five boys. That's pretty crazy statistic as well. Thanks well, for hey, joining me. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. I'm super excited to be here. I'm just, I'm pumped and I've been waiting for this and yeah. Me too. And you know, I want to talk about your book, Grow. You know, the okay. time of people listening to this, um, it may be out already. Um, okay. So, I mean, I have a lot to talk about actually, but I want to start there and okay. then go back. But so talk about Grow because we were talking a little bit before and you were saying people are focusing on the wrong things. Yes. So I still want to talk about the hot dog stand, the dry cleaners, and all that fun stuff. But I'll, let's I'll start probably, with what, start. <laughs> what? Why are people focusing on the wrong things? Well, so here's what happens, right? So, so someone gets some success. They have their business, and maybe they're maybe they've hit a million bucks, and they're stoked, and they should be. They should congratulate themselves, right? That's that is a, an achievement only four or five percent of businesses ever get to. So it's 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 a big deal, and um, and they hit a million bucks. And they want to grow. They want to go to two million or three million. Well, what happens is they they look at what they've done to get to a million, and they go, "I'm just going to do more of that." And it's it's just that's not right. I mean, as the as a as a well known book, you know, what what got you here won't get yeah. you there. Uh, talks about is 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 just that you when you are starting up, especially when you're in that 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 startup stage of a few hundred thousand dollars and, and you scale up to a million, you know what a lot of what got you there was focusing on sales and lead generation only. Like it wasn't improving the product, it wasn't having a good culture in your company, it wasn't systems and processes, right. it wasn't people, it wasn't making it wasn't it was you. Like it was your hard work in vast majority of cases. And it's not scalable to continue to do that, right? If I said um, you know, if I said, Hey Jeremy, you've got this million dollar business. What's your plan to get to 2 million? Well, maybe you could work twice as hard, but if I then said, hey, Jeremy, what's your plan to get to 10 million? You wouldn't, you couldn't do it. You can't work 10 times as hard. There's not as much as many right, dates, right. uh, or many hours in the day. So, so yeah, the, the, the book is all going to be about, um, there's going to be a little bit of sales and marketing talk in there. Cause I love it. I love sales and marketing, but right. it's going to be about everything else that you need to really grow a company. And if you leave these things out, this is where people stall or fall back or even go out of business. Yeah, so as you were putting this together, first of all, what's the title? Yeah, it's Grow, um, uh, How to Build a Business from 1 million to 10 million and beyond. Okay, so as you were putting this together, what surprised you that you found that was so important that you included? Well, you know, it wasn't even in putting this together because I'm I'm basing a lot of this off of off of my experience. But mm-hmm. here's the thing, and I know uh, some people may not be shocked by this. I'm maybe I'm just a little bit slow, but it was um, it was how important culture is mm-hmm. in the business because think about it, okay? You're 
your employees, take care of your customers, okay? And and if you don't have happy employees, you typically don't have happy customers, right? Yeah. And the thing with having happy customers is they lead to happy shareholders, right? So if you have, if you start where, where it all begins with the employees and you build this amazing culture, and I don't necessarily mean you have to, you know, buy them all free food all the time or, or, you know, some of the kind of crazy stuff you see that comes out of Silicon Valley, but as a place that they actually want to work, that actually cares about them, that actually mm -hmm. has tracking and systems and processes uh, to help them grow their company. If you, if you build that out, you'll be able to scale your company um, so much faster because everyone will be rowing in the same direction. So mm -hmm. we've made uh, in, in the last two years in a row, we've made the best places to work in mm -hmm. Idaho. Now, it's Idaho. Um, I get it. No, there's only about. I wasn't going to crack a joke there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, but um, but no, I mean, and it's one of those things because we focus on how do we make the experience for the team good, and it's one of the reasons our average customer stays with us for four years because the team makes the experience for the customer good, mm -hmm. uh, and then in turn, it you know makes a great experience for the shareholders, right? So even in Idaho, what do you do to foster good culture? Oh, I mean, there's so many things you can do. So you can do the little things, right? You can do the food. So that's a really easy place to start. And people will think I'm in. I'm, I'll come work for you. Free food. That's yeah. right. Everyone's <laughs> in food. So, so like some simple stuff. We, we, and we didn't invent all this. We took this from other people. But yeah. we have uh, unlimited cereal, peanut butter and jelly, and fruit. And so, <laughs> you know, it's just basic. Like that's really, really basic there. And you know what? My whole budget for 60 employees is like six hundred dollars a month or something. It's like wow, ten bucks. That's personal. amazing. Yeah. Yes. Well, think about it. How much is a large jar of peanut butter from Costco? You know, and a couple of some jellies, right. and a bunch of bread. Like it's really cheap, actually. So, um, so we do that, right? So there's one thing we found that people really liked flexible schedules. Now, that's got, huge. Yeah. It's huge. I'm not a big fan of the work from home schedule, um, mainly because I got a lot of friends that work from home and. Um, they're not doing a whole lot of work at home. <laughs> so, um, and so I'm not a huge fan of that. So I won't, I won't usually do kind of work from home type yeah. of stuff. So but, yeah, what's a flexible schedule then to you? Well, so, so let me tell you what it started as, and then let me tell you what it is. Right. So it started as, uh, it was, it was summertime and you know what we thought, man, people would really probably just like to go home early on Friday and start their weekend, wouldn't they? So we said, listen, you can come in anywhere from 7.30 to 9 a.m., whatever period of time that is, you could hear, you are considered on time as long as you're here by 9 a.m., and you just work your eight hours plus your lunch and go home. And so that means that if you want to come in at 7.30, we, we also have a thing called a flex lunch. So you can either take a 30 minute lunch or an hour lunch depending on what you need for the day. You can change it every day if you'd like. Um, so if you want to come at 7.30, only take a 30 minute lunch on, uh, on Friday and then go home at four o'clock. You totally could do that and start your weekend at four o'clock. And, and so that worked so well that then we did it Fridays and Mondays because we figured, well, what do they want to do on Monday? They want to come in at nine on Monday, right? You know, they partied all weekend. <laughs> They want to come in at nine o'clock. So, and now it's every single day of the week. And, and so we're very flexible on, mm -hmm. on that. And guess what else? It had a huge added benefit. I don't have to be a time card Nazi. I don't have to walk over and be like, it's eight 32. You're not here. What's going on? You know, um, it puts it in their control. Yeah. And it, pretty much everyone can figure out how to get to work in 90 minutes. Like you have a 90 minute window. You're an adult figure it out. Right. So, so the food, the flexible, Schedule. What else has uh, you find made a big impact? You know, we gave um, um, obviously just adding in basic benefits. Most small businesses do not even have basic benefits like um, like vacation time. But instead of doing vacation time and just giving them a couple of days, you know, we give them two weeks. We give them two weeks uh, from now. They accumulate it, but we give them two weeks from go. Why? Because I don't know about you, but I burn out sometimes. I mean, I work really, really hard and. I've kind of found that if I don't take off about once a quarter and just stop working for at least a couple of days, I'm like, oh my goodness, time to sell the company. Uh, it's over. I'm done. I'm throwing in the towel, you know? <laughs> right. I guess my employees do the same thing. Right. Uh, we throw an epic Christmas party. Epic. Um, so, so last year, the Christmas party, we did, we rented out this, this uh, beautiful uh, banquet hall in downtown Boise 
and uh, it was all decorated up, you know, catered, bar, the whole nine yards. And then I went out and myself and my wife went out and bought um, uh, just a gift for every single employee. Now, not an individualized gift, um, um, but what we did is we went out and bought big screens and we bought Xboxes mm. and Playstations and gift cards to fancy restaurants like Ruth's Chris and, and um, we bought uh, just all sorts of stuff. We had a gift and we sat there and did a raffle, laptops. And I would sit there and we had everyone's name in a hat and I would draw your name out and I'd say, you you know, you know, Rachel, you It's kind of like a good secret, Santa, as opposed to yeah, getting some right. like so, white elephant gift. Yeah, that's right. So and, and and so we would draw the name out of the hat and you'd win the TV. And then there was one I did rig. I do I do have to confess here. I don't even know if the employees know this, but I did rig one of them. So um, we have these two uh, women who work for us and they are insane like 90s music fans right okay and one of their favorite bands is new kids on the block i and saw you with my research i saw a picture a hat and a shirt shh, don't talk about this that is going to be the the image profile pic for this interview no, <laughs> i didn't know because no, i saw the initials and i didn't know what it meant so then i looked it up googled it yeah so my wife is also a huge new kids on the block fan. okay so okay i bought her tickets for christmas and had to uh, I so I, I was smart for my tickets. I bought them in Vegas, so I got to go to Vegas, but I had to attend the concert. So that was the that was the trade off, right? Got it. And, and um, so, anyways, I interrupted you. You have no, no, that's, nine, fine. that's fine. Yeah, just embarrass me. It's fine. Just yeah. guys, I got two shades here. I got <laughs> red. Okay, so Jeremy wants me to be red the whole time. That's right. <laughs> so I uh, I rigged it so that they would each win a pair of tickets to uh, go see New Kids on the Block, basically. So I bought them tickets in Salt Lake City and. And uh, they got to go to the concert and, and have a great time and stuff. And so, um, and bring a friend and stuff. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, that, you know, those are just a couple little examples that, that we do. To, that. To, Thanks for to, sharing that. Yeah. Have you found with your book and how you broke it down, are there certain inflection points that you found with the, you know, focusing on the wrong things, like from zero to a million, you're focused, like you were mentioning, focusing on new leads and sales and from a million. What were those things that you started to focus on in the different growth points? Well, so I think there's a couple places people stall out, right? Mm -hmm. And and you got to focus on different things depending on where you stall. And so right. you kind of stall. People start to stall around that million. Sometimes they don't quite get there. Sometimes they get just over it. And and when I say stall, it means they could stop growing, or it means they could slide back even, right? right? Uh, or they could just stand still. So it could happen. Uh, you know, somewhere around three million. I know we hit a we hit a rough patch at about three and a half million in revenue. And so, um, and we just, for, for a number of months, we just couldn't break it, you know, I mean, we just couldn't get over it. Uh, so somewhere around 3 million, uh, they seem to stall in the seven to 8 million. And again, about 10 million. And th that's just from my experience mm -hmm. in talking to people. Um, yeah. some people say 1 million, 3 million, 10 million, yeah. but my experience has, has shown me a little bit different. And, um, and, and so, yeah, there's different things, right? So, you know, for you, is the three, three and a half yeah, million and a half. point. What helped you push through that? It, that was when we finally started to actually dial in the culture. So what was happening mm. was our turnover was crazy on team members. Mm. We were losing them really, really fast, right? And we were doing a horrible job hiring. At, at one point, we were like, you know, four out of ten would not make it ninety days, and that was either they would quit or we'd have to fire them. That's how bad we were doing on yeah. hiring. And frankly. The reality of it, the situation was, is probably probably that should have been reversed. Probably six out of ten shouldn't have made it, uh, because we probably should have let a couple of them go. But we couldn't we couldn't do it. We're like, oh my goodness, we're so short staffed, right? right. Um, and so that's where we set up our own uh, our purpose. Why do we exist, right? What's the purpose of the company? Hmm. Um, what is our mission? What are we trying to accomplish here? Like so, right now, um, we want to our our mission. It was uh, and I did this wrong initially, so the mission isn't how I would recommend someone do it today, but um, our mission is to, to send a million newsletters a month. Well, back when I set that up, I was like, yes, that's the goal, you know, but, um, and a million newsletters a month, I get this from entrepreneurs. Let me give you a little inside baseball here. Everyone says, well, Sean, why didn't you make it a revenue goal? Why not $15 million in revenue, right? Well, here's the thing. Very few of your employees can get on board unless they're like your wife and, you know, um, you know, your parents or something like that, get on board and get behind a goal that is just solely there to make you rich, right? right? They're yeah. not, they don't get up in the morning like, oh my goodness, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to figure out how to make Sean really rich. Like, <laughs> That's why all those six people are fired. You asked them, what's your goal today? And they didn't say that. So 
yeah, yeah. I, so, I mean, it's amazing that they don't do that, but, um, and it saddens me. My heart breaks actually over it, but, but they don't. And well, so they're focused on serving the customers with the certain go, you know, well, and, and why a million? Because even though we're the largest custom newsletter company out there, there's like a, a generic newsletter company out there. And, and our research found that they did about a million newsletters a month. So, so right now, yeah, we're the largest custom print newsletter company, but that would make us just the largest newsletter company in general, right? And so they can get behind being the biggest, right? Mm -hmm. And so and so we said, okay, that's what we're going to do. We're going to get behind, and we're going to get them behind being the largest instead of being like, let's make Sean really rich. That that just doesn't resonate with any of them. So um, my wife loves it. She's all about it, though. Like, she's, she's really <laughs> – so, so – Is that so, the current uh, why, vision? Uh, so that's the current mission right now. Mission. Uh, we, yeah, we're, we're getting ready to redo it for the end of this year mm -hmm. uh, to our 2020 uh, mission. Okay. And here's the thing. I'm going to tell you something about this. This was a, we, a BHAG, right? Big, hairy, audacious goal. Yeah. And we set it, and it comes up at the end of this year. And here, I'm going uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you the, the, the revealing truth. We're going to miss it. I'm not going to hit it at the end of the year. All my growth, everything we've done, I'm going to miss it. But you know what? I called my shot, and we are we're we're gonna end up eight times larger than we were instead right. of ten times larger. Right. Yeah, you know it's okay. I'll be fine. For it, sure. It doesn't suck. And so that's the thing about a big goal. You make a crazy call, and it's a wild guess, yeah. and you do everything you can yeah. to get there. And sometimes you hit it, and sometimes you don't. Yeah. If it's too easy, it's boring. Yeah, and it's not as inspiring. It's not as inspiring. And so so now our new mission, which will be our, we're calling it our 2020 vision, you know, right? Because I kind have of something to, to play off of. And uh, That's a good one. Yeah, yeah. And so our 2020 vision, and it will incorporate finishing out this mission plus the new one. Hmm. And we're still kind of our, you know, uh, formulating that and trying to get it, get it wordsmithed and stuff. So I don't have it yet. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, so we started to have to put this all in place. And when we started to put this in place, we saw an immediate shift. Just... Uh, and I immediate, you know, first few months, right? We saw an immediate shift and, and people started going in the same direction. They started to all get, be able to rally behind it. We started seeing, uh, we started hiring and firing to our, our core values and our mission and mm -hmm. our purpose. And it was, um, you know, it just really was, was one of those things that, that absolutely changed our company, kept us, uh, you know, that's the, the stalling part of our stalling was, is that we, so first we didn't have these these items right purpose right. mission values then then the reason we didn't take off super fast after that was because we were implementing them for a few months and then once we got them in place we 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 took off like a rocket ship i mean jeremy we did in the last quarter of that year we added a hundred hundred and thirty thousand dollars in new monthly reoccurring revenue wow just just going straight up at that at that mm. point, right? So it's not the soft cool. stuff does go to the bottom line, right? It does, yeah. Yeah, it really does. So, what are some of the core values? Oh man, so uh, we're words, we're rewordsmithing these just a hair, but to give you an example, yeah, uh, we, we want to accentuate the positive because you know what? It's hard being in business, yeah. right? It's easy to get down yeah. on that. Okay, uh, we want to collaborate to innovate. Uh, which means we just want to work together, right? We want to um, uh, deliver a wow experience. Yeah, I, I ask that because it's interesting. You know, you start to make this, like you said, you make decisions on hires, you make decisions probably with customers based off of these principles. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So it makes a big difference. It, it, it makes, I mean... Let me tell you, when we when someone walks into interview, no matter how great their resume is, no matter how polished they they come across, okay, if they are out of whack, so we have one uh, that is called because uh, we're nerds, check yourself before you wreck yourself, which is basically don't have a big ego, right? You know, um, and Funny. if they are off mm -hmm. on any of them, we simply will not hire them. We pass. We pass one hundred percent of the time. Without fail, um, there's not even a question. Mm -hmm. And and so many people don't. They make an exception. Okay, I'm going to grab this person, right? Um, yeah. You know, all sorts of stuff. Like I, another one I, I really like is we give a damn. 
and uh, and I tell so I'm in uh, Idaho, and so um, we have a few variations of that one. We let them vary. I have a few. Um, uh, actually, I have a lot of people who are Mormon that work for me, right? So that we give a care, uh, we give a darn. That so sounds that so much softer, <laughs> so much nicer. We give a care. It's a Bible curse. I it's like a, that. Yeah. Uh, but here's the thing: we do so much to care about our team, yeah, and our community. And our customers and and so you know when our team when someone's in need um we rally behind them and help them what what can we do and the company does too it's not just the team rallies behind them we have a uh one of the things we we've done that we get the whole team involved because we feel that everyone should give back not just the company right yeah so, one thing i did notice when when i did my research is you it seems like you guys are always giving back. There's like donations to a local this or that, or you're posting different things for people to, um, you know, donate to different causes. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, we, we give a ton. Um, I mean, my personal goal in life is, is one day to be successful enough to, to give away a million dollars in a single year. Um, I, you know, we've, I I've, I've did well over six figures last year personally. In, in oh. giving away, but but not um, not anywhere near a million dollars. So um, still great, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because look, it's not it's not all about at the end of the day. I mean, it's not all about how much can I get, right? Um, and, and I found that if you give, you will get. Um, that's always been my experience. And 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 when you are when you think about it, really everyone in America, but definitely us entrepreneurs, the people who are listening to this podcast. The vast majority of us are so blessed, so insanely blessed, right? I mean, very few of us wake up to figure out where we're going to eat tomorrow, right? You know, what, what's, what, how are we going to get food? Um, mm -hmm. You know, we are Americans, are the one percenters of the world. You know, everyone rallies against bad one percenters, no evil guys, right? But compared to the rest of the world, like everybody here <laughs> practically in America is. So our, probably the cause that's nearest and dearest to my heart um, that we do and the team participates in this. Mm -hmm. We adopted this uh, county that is uh, the next county over from us. They're a, a poor county. And um, there's this, this thing that happens with the, you, everyone's seen like those angel wish list Christmas trees, like you get the three presents that the kid wants from the foster kid or whatever. Well, a lot of people don't realize that in, in many of the, especially the poor counties, um, after Thanksgiving, those kids, no, any kid that comes in the system just doesn't get presents mm -hmm. or they get very limited presents that they're just not set up to, to continue getting new kids on those, those, you know, Christmas uh, trees and, and get them out there and stuff. So what we've done is we've adopted that County and, and any kid who comes in after Thanksgiving, that kid's wishes come to us. And, and as late as Christmas Eve, I am out buying Christmas presents for kids who have come into the foster system. So my team buys we ask them to buy presents and we ask them to get all three presents on the list not one all three these are the only presents these kids are going to get so if they need to team up if they need to buddy up and do it that's fine we ask them to get all three presents on the list and and then i pick up the remainder of whatever presents are are necessary mm -hmm. um and um and so last year i was out on christmas eve picking up presents and running them to Nam nampa uh which is the city one city over to to take them so they could go give them to the kids to make sure that every kid woke up uh, on Christmas morning uh, with gifts there. And this is the third year in a row that we've been able to make sure every single kid had Christmas presents on Christmas morning. And that's amazing. So look, you, but you've got to get out there. You've got to care. you got to care. So big. Hmm. Thanks for sharing that, John. That's great. Um, also, you know, what helped you grow? Obviously the core values, the vision, the mission, um, the flexible scheduling, uh, the why, the systems and systems are yes. big, right? So what kind of systems do you have? Maybe it's software you use or the way you allow the team to, to function together or more efficiently. Yeah. So, well, one of, let me tell you one really new one. I can give you some software. Like we use help scout for customer service software. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, we're very, very fond of those guys. Um, we use, I have about 60 employees. So, um, um, we use uh, the HR software. I'm drawing a blank on it now. Uh, Zenefits, hmm. um, you know, which is great. It really takes a lot of time out of the HR process and stuff. Um, um, so those are all those are all good pieces of software. How do they communicate, kind of between 
each other? What do you? Well, what do so you like? the Help Scout won't communicate with Zenefits, but like Zenefits will communicate with payroll and with QuickBooks and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so if we give someone a raise, we can note it in Zenefits. It'll update it automatically in QuickBook, mm-hmm. uh, in QuickBooks, you know, so we can do our payroll and stuff. Um, and so yeah, that it just it took where we were going into multiple systems, having to tweak multiple things uh, down to down to one place. We just go in one place. If I need to see any performance reviews, if we need to see any disciplinary things, if we have any questions on that team member, it's all right there in Zenefits. We can log in and get it. Pull a report, anniversaries, birthdays. I mean, just Mm -hmm. um, they help get our 401k done uh, through Zenefits. I mean, just, you know, take care of our health benefits. Like it's so simple. It's so simple. And it's pretty inexpensive. I think we pay you know, seventeen hundred bucks a year for sixty employees or something like that. It's amazing. That. Yeah. Pretty cheap. So um so yeah, so so that's that's one thing, uh, or those are a couple of things we do. But here was an interesting thing that that we stumbled across that has made the productivity benefits we've gotten out of this have been insane. Um we used to have every team, so we have project managers, right? And then we have writers and we have designers. So yeah. that they're all work together. And what would happen is, is we'd have a, we had a pod or a grouping of designers, eight designers, they'd all sit together, eight project managers, they'd all sit together. Same thing with writers. We have editors and other departments, but those are the three main ones, right? And what we realized was, is that this was causing some communication challenges. So we went in and we changed them to, to pods. So now we have a, a lead project manager and then two uh, additional project managers. We have three writers and two designers and those make up one pod and they all sit together and they all share the same customers. Hmm. We have seen like a ballpark 30 to 40% increase in productivity since we shifted into those pods. Hmm. And that was just the proximity of them all working on the same clients, the same projects and sitting next together. I mean, absolute game changer for us. So That's amazing. Do they use, do you use like a communication, you know, um, obviously they have a lot of moving parts with these projects. Yeah. Do you use like an Asana or one of these task Team. management? What's that? Teamwork. Teamwork, okay. Yeah, yeah, we use teamwork. But, you know, one of the best forms of ways to communicate, uh, you know, instead of using Slack, and instead of using some of these other, you know, we can do instant messaging and stuff, is that um, it would be kind of like this. If we're sitting next to each other and I go, hey, Jeremy, are you having a call today with uh, Joe Smith? Oh, great. When you're on the phone with him, can you ask him to give me back that proof? Right. It works so well. It's like, like uh, right same there. thing with newsletters to the internet. Like there's something called physical mail that people actually open up and receive. There's something called just talking to someone as to opposed to. Yeah. Here's the funny thing. Yeah. People are really behind small businesses. And if, if, if they can trust me on this, and, and I won't talk specifically about newsletters. I'll just talk about direct mail in general. Hmm. But if they can trust me on this, and they would be wise to do it. Direct mail right now is having a huge comeback, huge. I I just got off the phone maybe a couple days ago with a company who owns 500 pet stores, 500. Like that's not a small company, right? Um, Probably somewhere in the neighborhood of a half a billion dollar company, somewhere, you know, maybe more than that. I don't know. They're huge. And, uh, they, this year they reallocated, uh, their, they took their direct mail budget from 10% to a third of their entire marketing budget. Mm. And the thing about it is they, because they found that especially on a, on a, doing local stuff like that, it just made all the difference in the world. They were able to actually get to the customers, get them, drive them into the stores. And so big companies are moving heavily, heavily into direct mail right now. And usually the, the us little guys, you know, so under say 25 million, 50 million even, Um, we don't, we, it takes us years to catch up to what the big guys are doing. And, and right now, I mean, that's not the first company that's told me they've really reallocated their budget. A good, good friend of mine who you may know, Craig Simpson is, uh, yeah, yeah, great guy. Uh, he works with tons of companies on this and he's just seeing a huge influx from these big companies as well. Um, so if you can figure out how to incorporate that into your business model, um, you'll be ahead of the curve of everyone else in, in in your industry. So you think it's just less noisy? Like people are just, uh, you know, they're getting a ton of emails and maybe some spam and there's that's certain the things part. hitting the inbox or sorry, the, the mail. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely part of it. Like, like when you really think about it, I mean, well, I don't know. I don't know about you. I get 150, 
250 emails a day. So That's much. Lot, yeah. Yeah, so much that my assistant actually goes through all my emails before they ever get to me. I have two folders or no, three folders I look at. Um, she she puts she filters them into folders, and you either are in the urgent folder, which means I need to respond right away. You're in the needs response folder, or you're in the personal folder, or you're in one of. Are you deleted? Well, <laughs> there's 20 other folders. Right. <laughs> it's just that, or 18 <laughs> other folders. It's just that that I don't ever go into those ones. You know, my promotions folder. If, I mean, I go in there if I need to get a good idea for a headline or I need to get a good idea for, you know, some copy or a new lead magnet or something. But I don't go into the promotions folder, you know, typically to buy anything, which is crazy because every now and then I do go into it. I'm like, oh, I totally would have bought that. Um, but I don't ever see it. It never gets to me. Right. And I found that as, as, com- as you get bigger, um, as your company grows, it gets harder and harder to get to those top level executives via email and stuff. For and, sure. So tons of noise in email. Uh, we are also being bombarded, um, you know, every which way. And so when I can sell via direct mail, I'm selling in a vacuum. My competitors aren't there. My, I'm not on Facebook where they're seeing right. my ad on Facebook and, the and uh, you know, my competitors ad. Like the ADD doesn't kick in like I'm just going to yeah. click over here because you're, you know, a million tabs open. Um, yeah. What do you it, recommend it, that pet company do? So they come to you. They're like, okay, we want to allocate 30% of our budget. Yeah, you're so you're the say, expert. Yeah, did you say tech company? No, the the pet oh. company. The pet company. Oh, the pet company. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we talked to them about um, just, well, so usually the easiest way to start with that is, okay, well, what were you doing last year? I was doing 10% of my budget for postcards and, and um, you know, specialty direct mail like that. And I said, okay, um, well, what do you want to do this year? And they said, well, we want more new customers in. And I said, well, have you maxed out the postcard campaigns yet? And they said, no. And I said, well, we don't really need to invent anything new. You can just put more money into the postcard campaigns that are working. Like, you know, this is this is actually really simple. Um, and so their their solution was very easy. They they could easily spend the vast majority of that budget um, on that campaign. Um, and now I also recommended that they do a campaign to their A buyers based off of their VIP card. Mm-hmm. Um, like, and, would you recommend like a monthly well. like a the VIP, like a newsletter that teaches them something or what, what do you think they should do? Well, so a couple things. Uh, if, if you're an A buyer and I can get you into the store more often, more frequently, then um, you're, you're more likely going to spend even more, right? So because we already know you spend a lot. That's, that's what you do here. You spend a lot of money. So the more time I can get you in for visits, the, the better it is, right? So, you know, uh, I told them there's a lot of things they could do. They could do a VIP promotion. Uh, at each store where it's like, hey, special shopping night, extended hours just for VIP, or have special gifts that they can get, like a special coupon that's just for, for the VIP people and they have to bring in this coupon to get the to get the offer. And it's, you know, maybe it's one item at cost, you know, it's a loss leader, but it, you know, we know when these guys come in what they spend on average, so let's just get them in again, right? Yeah. So, you know, we didn't go through the whole details of the campaign, but those were a couple like quick, you know, quick little hits and tips. Um, that they could do, but, and, and that would probably, you know, because that's so much more room in the postcard campaigns they were already doing because they weren't using the whole list. Um, you know, that's the easiest stuff to go, to go after. Mm-hmm. And so who is best, the best customers for newsletter pro? I know you guys serve a lot of dentists and who yep. else? Yeah. Who do you guys serve? Um, so typically it's million dollar plus businesses. It does happen to be a lot of service based businesses, but you know, there's an example of a pet store that we do a newsletter for. So, you know, I mean, it, it's, I do some for funeral homes too. You know, So, I mean, who knows, really? right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do they send out in their, in their monthly newsletter? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's crazy. Uh, but they send it, they send it to people who, so mom has passed away. They send it to the kids. Uh, if say dad is still alive. Because dad's going to pass away and the funeral home wants to be the funeral home of choice when dad goes to. So if both parents are deceased, they stop sending them the newsletter. And um, yeah, I haven't looked at one of those in a while. I'm uh, curious what they send in there. Like, what It's are... good news, very positive, uplifting content. Yeah. Yeah. So as you might imagine. And I think there is some... Um, there could be probably estate things in there, I guess, of how they handle yeah. the estate there's afterwards or something like, grief, like that. Like how to get over grief and like there's a there's a little articles like that too. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, uh, it's been like a year since the last time I looked at that newsletter. But yeah, we have like two or three funeral homes, which I would have never have guessed 
like in a million years. Um, in fact, I was sitting. You're the to... number one newsletter business to funeral home. That's it in yes. the world. Yes. No. I uh, I'm sitting up next to this guy on a plane, and um, and he was going to the same conference I was speaking at, and he he starts chatting with me, and and he tells me he has this this funeral home business, and and this was the first one we'd ever worked on. I'm like. I got to be honest, we've never done this for a funeral home. So, I mean, we can try it if you'd like, but I don't know if I don't know if it's going to work. Right. So, but that was like three years ago or something like that. And still doing they it. They still do it. Right. So um, I'm, gl- I'm glad we got the formula right for them. But I, I, it was literally a shot in the dark. I had no idea. So, well, I mean, you guys have a certain formula to what you do. Right. Well, I mean, we know what works. I had an idea, but I, I didn't know how it was going to be received by the person getting it. That was my concern. It right. wasn't. It wasn't that I couldn't figure out the right content. It was... Is is the son going to be upset that he's getting something from the funeral home? You know, right. that was my concern. So yeah. So funeral homes. Oh yeah, sorry. Service based businesses. Yeah. Um, you know, so if you have a high, if you're if you're running with a good customer annual value or lifetime value, you would like to retain them, um, and get them to refer more. Then those are who we work. But it, it is usually million dollar plus businesses. We work with very few companies that are doing less than a million. There's maybe a few lawyers. You know, who are like three quarters of a million or something like that, but uh, a lot of service-based businesses where where your relationship, your your relationship with them is part of the the gig because that's a huge portion of what we do is build your celebrity and credibility and your relationship with them. Um, so that's a big portion of of how we kind of put the the product together. So so yeah, that's that's the you know the the broad scope of who we work with. So is it a lot? Does it tend to be a lot more dentists and lawyers than any other service professional, or are there any others that uh, tend to creep in? There? Lawyers, financial advisors, um, uh, plumbers, electricians, H- HVAC guys. Um, um, let me think here. There's a, there's another big one. Oh, physical therapists. We work with a lot of physical therapists. You know, here's the thing on it. And, and we can talk about this or not talk about this. One of our best marketing strategies has been partners. And so we have a lot of dentists and a lot of lawyers because we have partners in those niches. Who right. are partners. And, and so in turn, we end up with a lot of those. I mean, you know, we have uh, tons of customers. It just depends on, you know, it depends on, on you know, which, which niche. So, I mean, I probably have like three or four partners in the, legal niche, um, you know, that we work with and we're, I'm working on one or two more that, you know, like, uh, I'm trying to work a deal with Avo right now, which is a huge, um, you know, legal, the legal review site. Yeah. Review site. Yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, you know, so it just depends on where we have partners. It, it really, that's where you see the concentration. It's not just because, uh, now lawyers, it is partially because they're limited on what they can do marketing wise, right? Mm-hmm. Dentists to some extent, less limited, but limited to an extent. And there, those are all relationship uh, pieces. So, uh, where I think people miss out though. So let me tell you where I think people are missing the yeah. boat. Even, even our own customers, like they sometimes just get cheap and I can't convince them otherwise. Um, yeah. maybe like, this will, <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm like, this is what you guys pay me for. Like you should listen to me. Um, so here's what it is. And well, and I'll use my own business as an example. People are ultimately ready to buy when they're ready to buy, not when you're ready to sell them. Right. I mean, you know it from Rise 25. Right. I mean, they're either ready for mastermind or they're not ready for mastermind. And, and you discounting it, which I know you would never do. But as a theoretical thing, right, is it even not going to make a difference if you brought them in? It would be like the worst possible customer. Right. It would be horrible. OK. And they're not going to get a lot out of it. And they're going to badmouth you, even though I've talked to numerous people who say how amazing it is. Right. So. Yeah. So it's you. You know, that's not the solution. Right. They have to be ready. So, but, but a lot of people, especially because we're in information overload right now, they get paralysis by analysis. So they start gathering all this information and then they just freeze. They're like during, during the headlights, right? They're just stuck. They can't, they can't make a decision. They can't go forward. So what most people do is they give up on them. Mm. You know, one week, one month, two months, very common. They give up on them. Now in my company, we don't do that because I realized that those leads cost me a lot of, a lot of flipping money to be honest with you. Right. You know, it spends a lot of money to go get a lead. Sometimes I'm having to schlep out to a trade show and go do a whole speech and be away from my kids and my wife and, um, and to go out and get these leads. Like if I'm going to go do that, I want to maximize that, that time. Right. right. It's all in the follow up. Yeah. So we follow up. Now we follow up, not just with email because 
you know, if it's a guy like me who never even sees the emails, it's no good. So you follow up with the newsletter, with some direct mail, with phone calls, and with emails. It's, so it's not, I'm not just saying, hey, it's only newsletters, right? right. Now, at some point, we can't keep calling. You know, they're like, stop calling me. I'm not ready yet, you know? Um, and so that's where the newsletter and then the email follow-up comes in. We're always trying to add value and give them good content. But last year, 29% of our new revenue came in from people who bought, who had found us originally 12 months ago or longer. Wow. So if you really think about that. It could that, be a long sales cycle, yeah. Yeah, well, and anytime you're selling something that's, that's a, a high-priced ticket item, right, you know? And it's not like we're crazy high priced or anything, but it's, you know, I mean, it's not, uh, it's not know, like a $19 a month, like SAS. Yeah, it's not a $20 a month subscription either. Right. You know, it's a, it's a buck a month or so to send out a newsletter. Right. So it costs money. And, um, and so when you've got that, it takes time. And so few people who are selling in that kind of, in, in those conditions, give it the time that it, that it needs. Right. So so you're saying, what did you advise them? They're making big mistakes. Oh yeah. So I advise them. You've got to put your good prospects that don't convert on the list. It's that simple. Now, if you really want to get sophisticated, you put them on the list and you make separate offers, right? Mm. So you do an insert. You segment it a little bit. Yeah, you segment it. You do an insert and the prospects get an offer and maybe the non-prospects don't get any offer. Who mm. knows? Maybe they get a customer retention offer. Maybe they get you know whatever else. But you segment it and then you make offers. Now, the offers don't have to be discounts. Like We don't like to discount. But like, um, so for example, one offer will will run as as I'm uh, for for customers only. So people who can who who work with us, I'll, I do a free workshop for our customers. Uh, we're actually getting ready to do our very first one. This is new, so it's not something we've we've just had a lot of requests, and so it's not something we've tried yet. Uh, it happens in a couple of months, and and we're gonna show them how we scaled, right? And they can get this ticket for literally for nothing. They got to pay like a hundred dollar deposit, and they get it back when they show up, right? And, and it's 25 people in a room and I'm going to teach them for two days in beautiful Boise, Idaho. So, so the offer is, Hey, look, instead of, uh, paying 2000 bucks, which is, which every now and again, we will sell tickets. Someone really wants to go, we'll sell a ticket for 2000 bucks and let that person come out. Um, instead of paying 2000 bucks, become a customer, I'll give you a ticket for free. Hmm. So that could be the offer, right? It doesn't have to be save 10%. It's an additional right? like bonus or incentive for them to do it. Yeah, yeah, simple stuff. If you're if you're familiar with direct response marketing, you'll be like, yeah, yeah, Sean, that's that's easy stuff. I get no, it. I think, I mean, even the people who know it forget some of the fundamentals of sure. just I do yeah. list segmentation because it's it takes a little more effort and work to do it. A little more, effort, but yeah. the return is much much more. It yeah, it's huge. And so so we always send offers to the prospects, and we sometimes have offers for customers. Just depends. So you were mentioning the different pods, Sean. One one question I had: Are there differences between the yellow team, the blue team, and the green team? Yeah, you did really good research. Uh, well, there's differences in um, sometimes. Well, there's differences obviously in the clients that they have, but we you got oh, there is okay. Yeah, yeah. So blue team has a you know hundred some odd clients, and those are only blue team clients. And the yellow is it pod- certain like genre of clients, or is it just no? No, okay. no necessarily. Um, okay. We do have. You know, we do have a couple pods that just because this is how it worked out, they tend to specialize in a particular niche. Right. Um, and when, uh, when at all possible, we'll put someone in that niche in that pod. But pods fill up. My blue pod right now is max. They just can't take more clients. They're at 100. Mm-hmm. percent They might even be at 103 percent or something. Right. Now um, they're also, you know, currently one of uh, they've currently won the pod competition for approvals the last three months in a row. So everyone's gunning for them, and we do a lot of competitions. Mm. People like competition, and so we do a lot of competitions. And they, they're currently our highest performing pod as well, and they're they're completely maxed out. So how do you display that? Is there like a leaderboard, or how do people know? Yep, there's a leaderboard. It's updated every single week, um, so that we know where they are, and they can they can actually see the updates live on a Google Doc, like by minute by minute. Oh, they, really? Yeah, uh, but it is updated every week for the whole company to see. Um, and, and yeah, it's a huge competition. They get to, the winners get to come up and spend the prize wheel, which is like a $300 prize wheel I got off Amazon that we have little, we create a little, I love that. Everyone wheel. likes spending the prize. Wheel. Everyone wants to spend the prize wheel and they get, they can win gift certificates to Dutch bros, uh, the, the most popular coffee place out there or Amazon or four hours of PTO or, you know, whatever they want, whatever, whatever's on the prize wheel that time around. Um, see, I tried to be funny with it. I thought there should be a bankrupt on the prize wheel. Like, <laughs> 
I shouldn't have a bankrupt. <laughs> and uh, and and I was like, listen, if any, if there's only be one little sliver. There's 50 slots here. This one slot's going to be bankrupt. If anyone hits the bankrupt, uh, everyone loses their prizes, and the second pot <laughs> comes up and spends. And Except you have a weighted thing on the bankrupt, <laughs> so that one sliver happens to hit up. Well, the 30% of the time. Was, is like the third guy who spun. I did put one up there. I wasn't going to actually do that, but the third guy who spun, spun bankrupt. <laughs> and I had to kill the joke. But um, <laughs> but yeah, so we have the prize wheel, and then we buy them lunch if they win. And um, uh, we have this trophy right now that may even be there already that we're getting, which is like seven feet tall that goes in front of their pod so everyone knows they're the winners. That's interesting from a hiring perspective, too. Because it's like a, almost like a NBA draft or a baseball draft because they only want the A players if there's this inter-office competition. Well, and so we have had, uh, even uh, maybe, I guess this was a couple months ago, three months ago, we had this guy who was just, he was, he was checking out. He was getting ready to go, obviously. He was checking out. He was like disappearing for like an hour or an hour and a half going out to his car, like FaceTiming his wife and, you know, whatever else he was doing out there, taking a nap. And... Um, his pod ratted him out. Yeah, because <laughs> they lost. And right, they lost because of him. I could see that. So, I could see like people wanted to trade for people too. Like we wanted to trade for this person. Can't, do that. We... can't trade. Um, <laughs> only management can make trades. So right. Well, that's yep. that's how it works, right? That's how it works. So, Sean, you know, I also read. It's not like you were born out of the womb, uh, writing good newsletters or great. You know, with this, um, actually, you claim to be the world's worst newsletter person for two years. Yes. When you had the dry cleaning business. First yeah, of all, how did you get in the dry cleaning business and what did you do with the newsletters that was was horrible? So bad. Yeah. OK, so um, I'm also a solid uh, C minus English student. So okay. I'm just like, I'm a, <laughs> I, I got, Dude, I got everything going for you. <laughs> everything over it. I got by because the because uh, the teachers liked me. I was charismatic, you know. Um, so yeah, so I got into the dry cleaning business. So it, it starts. I, my my first real business, right, um, was a hot dog stand. Two of them in front of Lowe's yeah. Home Improvement Store. So, I mean, yeah, I did. Those I think more. you. I think one summer. I don't know if it was a summer, but you did a half a million dollars worth of hot dogs. Yeah, we did half a million. I don't know how that's possible, but yeah, yeah. It was a lot of hot dogs. That's so we were we were sending out a lot of wieners. So. Uh, <laughs> So we did half a million dollars worth of hot dogs. Um, it was a franchise. It was called it was. Woody's Hot Dogs. Yep, it was called Woody's Hot Dogs. They had the contract for Lowe's, uh, like west of the Mississippi or something. Mm. Like and um, and as Woody's Hot Dogs, the the slogan from the franchise on every menu board was, "It's the big one, baby. It's a Woody." So that was company company slogan uh, on our hot dog stand. So. Uh, a lot of play and, on words uh, opportunities for those newsletters. Absolutely, if, if there were ones. There was no newsletters. Right. Woody's hot dogs. So, um, and I did the normal things as a kid. Like I mowed lawns. The only kind of well, I, I had two abnormal things. Uh, I had a traffic school, so I'm like 17 years old, and I owned a traffic school teaching adult uh, teaching adults how to drive. Really? Not actually, teaching them, t- giving them instructions so they get out of their tickets. Um, and uh, That's good business. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was okay. Everyone wants to get out of their their tickets. Everyone wants to get out of a bad ticket. Yeah. And then uh, the other thing I had that was unique uh, was a pager com- a pager company. So in high school, I sold pagers to all my friends on reoccurring monthly revenue. So it was great. Um, <clears throat> but it wasn't funny when I it wasn't fun when I had to go find Johnny because he owed me my eight bucks for the month. I'm like, dude, you give me your my eight bucks, I'm gonna turn your pager off. You know, that wasn't as much fun. But uh, I always got my eight dollars. So right. Yes. <laughs> That's so, funny. Yeah. Um, but I own this dry cleaning company, and and what happened was is it was so I I used to think franchising was like it. That was like the cat's meow. So why did you get out of the hot dogs? Because it seems well, like it was doing well. It was doing well. I was doing okay with it. Um, well, one, I was in Northern California, and believe it or not, it still gets cold in Northern California in the wintertime. Standing out in front of the Lowe's Home Improvement selling hot dogs in the winter sucks. Um, two, it, it wasn't scalable, right? I mean, I was doing half a million bucks a year. I was dependent on whatever came into Lowe's. I couldn't really advertise and get new business. and. And so, um, yeah, it was a great business, and it was all cash. Although I still paid all my taxes, um, <laughs> you know. If anyone's listening, I, what's that? If anyone's listening, if anyone's mm-hmm. listening, uh, it was long enough ago that it wouldn't matter anyway. So, <laughs> no, um, I didn't know any better, so I paid all my taxes. <laughs> but I, I went in and did 
you know, did that business and yeah, it just, it just wasn't for me. Well, and so what happened was, is I spent my twenties jumping from business to business to business, trying to figure out what I wanted to be when I was big. Right. Some people try college majors. Some people jump from job. I bought and sold companies. And so I had like eight of them or something like that in my twenties. Um, so I started this dry cleaning company and that came about, uh, interestingly enough, uh, it's how I got my started newsletters and it's how I was sold the business too. So, oh, wow. yep. So they're a franchise. And I was, um, I know, listen, this is anyone who's watching the video is especially going to find this hard to believe. Okay. But I was a very big nerd back then. Okay. And, um, (laughs) I I know, I know the ladies probably are thinking there's no way possible. Maybe if we look at your new kids on the block. (laughs) That's that's just, that's just between you and I. Okay. okay? And don't uh, mention that. And so can we edit that out? Um, (laughs) (laughs) So so they, you're happily was, married, so it's okay. That's that's it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I was a big nerd, and uh, I would get these um, agreements. They're now called franchise disclosure documents. They used to be called UFOCs, um, but you know, write that down and think about that for a minute. And uh, they changed the name of it not too long ago. And uh, so they're UFOCs, and I literally called companies and gave my information out to like fifty or 60 different companies and got these big, thick, like two inch. I love where this is going, Sean. Keep going. Yeah, I, yes. I would love to read them. I would go in and I would, I, I was learning about all these guys' business models. It's you know, amazing. it's really yeah. interesting. And I would get tons of phone calls um, uh, just about these companies from salespeople. One lady, only one, continued to follow up with me. See, I wasn't ready to buy them. I was researching because I knew I wanted to get out of the hot dog stands, but I had to sell those. Because I couldn't, I'd put forty-five thousand dollars into each stand, or forty-five into the first one, and thirty-five thousand into the second one, and I couldn't just walk away. And I was making too much money, and so I had to sell them. And I sold both of them for around ninety thousand bucks each, something nice. like. That. Yeah, so I made a nice little return on that. Yeah. But I needed that ninety thousand dollars each to the hundred eighty grand. I needed that to pay off some bills because I had a few loans from buying them, and I needed that to then start the new company. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, I I'm probably at this point. Uh, 21, 22 years old. You're so young. I, yeah. I don't have a lot of money, right? So I go in and I um, um, start looking, and this lady is the only one who continues to follow up with me, and she does it via a print newsletter primarily. Hmm. And I get this newsletter, and I, I got to be honest, I, I haven't gone after franchises to sell this, but I really believe it'd be a game changer for one or two of them if they would do it. For the newsletters or what? For this newsletter, yeah. Oh, yeah. That would be – why Why would they not? I know. Huge, right? So she would send me this newsletter, hmm. eight pages, 12 pages, somewhere in that neighborhood. I actually still have every single copy she ever sent me in a binder uh, in my office. I would saved them all these years. And, um, and in it would be things like welcoming a new franchise and talking about how excited they were to be a part of the team, right? And it would have the top 10 board and it would show where people were shifting through the top 10 of the franchise. This guy had the most sales this month. This guy you know, was number two, this guy was number three. Now it wouldn't tell the sales, but it would show where they were shifting through, right? Mm. And it went through and it talked about someone's success and she'd give some marketing tips or some customer service tips. And I would get this newsletter and devour it. I loved it. And my, my now wife, but girlfriend at the time, hated it because I'd be like, Babe, you need to come home and read this so we can talk about it. Like, check this out. This is so amazing. And we can talk about it, talk about it. And she starts promoting about six months before the annual convention. She starts promoting the annual convention and how great it's going to be. Oh, you're going to learn all these things. These speakers. You're this is be- dry cleaning. This is dry cleaning. Yeah. This is, yeah, this is like the most boring business on the planet, right? And she's promoting this convention. And, um, and I was so excited. I wanted to attend this convention. I had sold one of the franchises instead of paying off all of my or one of the hot dog stands and instead of paying off all of my debt I saved some of it and bought this business before the second one sold. Mm. I could I had to go to the conference. I had to get in on this and it was about a year, not quite a year from my initial contact with her as when I finally bought. I was ready to buy. And like I said earlier, people are ready to buy when, when they're ready to buy, not when you're ready to sell them. Did you ever find out who she learned from? Um, she yes, she learned it from. She used to be in the real estate game, in the franchise real estate game, and so when um, uh, like Remax or one of those guys like that, I, I don't believe they do it anymore. But they used to send a newsletter like that to franchise to pr- franchise prospects and to franchisees. Mm. And um, and if they do it now, they've, I'm sure they've gone electronic and it doesn't work anymore. But um, 
but yeah, that's that's where she learned it from. That was her original her original thing. So part of my contract with her was to I had to send out a monthly newsletter and I had to send her a copy to prove I was doing it. She knows and it works. She knows it works. Yeah. Now, let me tell you where she made the mistake because she made a huge mistake right there. Yeah. As the franchisor, she should have provided us one that we edited with our with our information on. You okay. customized it a bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They didn't, they made you start from scratch. Made us start from scratch every oh, wow. month. So that is weird. That is weird. Yes, and and so I then proceeded to send the world's most boring newsletter for two years, and I would talk about how to get deodorant residue out, uh, deodorant stains out, and grass stains. And, My wife would read that. No, I'm just... Oh man. It was, <laughs> It was so bad, and um, I couldn't figure out why I never got any comments because I studied marketing, and everyone was like, "This works! Everyone loves our newsletter. It's so amazing!" And I couldn't figure out why no one loved my newsletter. Like, why was it? It's, it hurt me on the inside. I was sad, and so um, finally one day I was like, "Well, look," and I'm like, "Dude, this newsletter is so boring. This newsletter sucks." And I wrote about like my Disney World vacation that I just taken with my family. And that was the main article, and then there was a, a secondary article that was probably the same thing, like you know how to get grass stains out or something, right? And all of a sudden, I got all these comments. Mm. Oh, we're going to Disney World too. I put a big picture of Disney World in there. We just got back from Disney World. We love going to Disney World. Our kids have never been, but we're saving up to go. Whatever it was, and I'm like, I think I struck on something. It's <laughs> <laughs> really good because I'm boring. So the big mistake people make is they talk they talk all about their business and. If, if you get my newsletter, um, you'll find that we don't ever really talk about newsletters. I mean, we may be like, hey, you should totally have a newsletter, but there's not some intense training on, what, on, on doing newsletters. Like, no one cares. If they want to do a newsletter, they'll call us and pay us to do it, you know? Or they'll buy <laughs> my book on newsletter marketing, right? But they're not going to, they don't yeah. want to read about it every month. They'd rather put a bullet through their pinky toe, you know? <laughs> so then transitioning from the dry cleaning to actually, Strictly newsletters. Yes. Yes. So that wasn't quite as um, seamless as that because I, I ended up having a bunch of businesses over the years. I moved from California to Idaho. Um, we hit a recession. And so when I, right when I moved, and so the you know 2007 area, and um, I was like, hey, should I start this? Mar I had a marketing company that did direct mail in California and the, and the dry cleaning business. Yeah. And so I'm in Idaho now, and I'm like, okay. Uh, sold the dry cleaning company, got like I don't know a quarter of a million bucks or something like that. So I had a little bit of little bit of cash, had some bills I had to pay off, put a down payment on the house, moved my family, but I had a little money to live on. But I'm like, well, this is going to run out pretty quick. I better figure out what I'm going to do. And it was either start another marketing company, which is what I wanted to do, or start a dry cleaning business, which is not what I wanted to do. But the economy was starting to get shaky, and I was scared to start a marketing yeah. company. To be honest with you, I was worried that no one would buy. And um, so I started a dry cleaning business, and I put a hard deadline. I told my wife, I will not own this company for more than four years. It will oh, so not you ended up starting another one. I started a second one in Idaho. Got it. Uh, built it out really fast. It had a little information business on it. As not a, I, this second one wasn't a franchise. It was my own version of the concept. Um, you knew how to run one. By I knew how that, to yeah. run one, and I knew how, how I, I felt I knew how to run it better even. And um, and uh, started doing information marketing a little bit and stuff, but um, um, I then knew I was gonna, in 2011, I was coming up on four years. And so I started prepping the company to sell. And I, I did sell it again to the, uh, I did sell it again, uh, this time for, for even more money, which was great, because it was a bigger company. But, um, but I, I was then started, 2011 is when I started Newsletter Pro, and I was part-time for the first year. So at the end of the first year, we had done just over $100,000 in sales under Newsletter Pro. So we were just a baby. Who were you targeting early on? Uh, anyone who would listen to me. <laughs> so my whole marketing Did strategy, you tend to target like dry cleaning business? Did you have that experience uh, or not really? I didn't think they had the money for it. Um, well, I thought they had the money for it. I just thought they were too cheap for it. Let's put it that way. Because yeah. I was in the info space and I, I struggled sometimes to sell $1,500 courses and stuff like that to them. So I didn't, um, I didn't want to target those guys. Uh, I mean, I targeted doctors, uh, dentists mainly. I targeted chiropractors, vets, um, um, you know, some uh, retail businesses. So yeah, it was just like literally, if I could go in and have a conversation with you, I I would, and that was the start of it. So Sean, why do you think 
not as many franchises use you. You think they we just have in in like in house stuff, or it would seem like a no brainer. Yeah, you know what it is. We've never put any marketing muscle behind it, and mm. they just don't know we exist. Yeah, I guess. So yeah. Well, yeah. If this lady still does the dry cleaning. Maybe you should be doing all the new. Yeah, she doesn't. She doesn't anymore. But uh, that that company is now defunct, which is a long, very interesting story. But probably one, uh, probably one we can't go over. But uh, but long, very interesting story. So. Um. So, uh, and aside for a sec, do you have to get that? Well, uh, no, I don't have to get it, but okay. the husband walks in. Oh, okay. That's what's going on. And um, talk, so, uh, the, and aside, what, if you were to buy a franchise now, what would you buy? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, well, let's put, let me. You've probably looked through hundreds and hundreds, maybe I've thousands. I've a lot of them. Yeah. Um, you know, I I like service based businesses, so I would go. I would find something that was service based, but had lots of scale. You know, I find most franchises they want to give you a small territory, and you can you can grow it to maybe a couple hundred thousand bucks or a million dollars or something like that, but you can't get it big enough. Hmm. Um, so I'd have to have lots of scale. Maybe um, uh, my buddy's killing it in a franchise called Lunchbox right now, which is hmm. a uh, waxing salon. Uh, he used to own a bunch of Baja Fresh franchises. A waxing salon. Yeah, so like women go to it to get various areas waxed. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't do any waxing. He just owns it. Okay. So his wife won't let him. <laughs> so, okay. uh, but he's he's murdering it in, in that business. I mean, just really? doing. Oh yeah. Um, if yeah. I was to start over right now, so if I sold my company tomorrow, yeah. Um, which I, I have no plans on selling. I, I've been. I actually keep because we made the Inc. Magazine fast growing company list. I keep getting uh, venture capitalists and offers and stuff, but. I'm like, no, I'm having fun still. So as long as I'm still having fun, I'm going to keep exactly. doing it. But, um, I would probably go into an event-based business. I think event? people want to What do you mean? Events. So like, um, um, you know, you've seen these, these, you know, mud, tough mudder and, and, and those kind of races and stuff yes. like that. I think people, they want something to put on Facebook. So um, I don't think that's going away anytime soon. Right. Uh, you know, I thought it was a fad. I think it's here to stay. So here we go, you know, and so I think people want uh, I, I, that would be one I would seriously look at if I was if I was starting over right now, because I think I think people really want experiences. And I know for me, I told my I told my wife, um, like, she's like, what do you my birthday was just a few weeks ago. She's like, what do you want for your birthday? And I'm like, I want to do something fun. Yeah. Um, my my next big goal for the company um, is to um, is when when we hit the goal. I'm going to fly to Russia. I'm going to get into a MiG-29. We're going to go up uh, 77,000 feet Mach 2 to the edge of space, and I'm going to see the curvature of the Earth and outer space at the same time. And uh, my understanding is I'm going to get to take the stick and do some some flips. And does this and, exist? Are you yeah, making this? Oh, it does. So you could do this technically if someone wanted to tomorrow. They could do it tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. It's about 20 grand uh, plus your trip to Russia. And uh, so when we hit mm -hmm. uh, 12 million in revenue, um, that's my gift to myself. Wow. So will you wear a GoPro? I mean, do they even have them up there? Like, will that just explode? I, I try. I'm gonna try. <laughs> I want every little video I can. So my my dream, uh, you know, my at one point, uh, probably because of the movie Top Gun, uh, was to be a fighter pilot wow. in, in the Air Force, right, or in the Navy or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I was an Air Force brat, so I kind of leaned more towards the Air Force, and. Um, um, but yeah, at one point I thought that's what I wanted to be. I quickly found out that I don't take orders very well. So, uh, just ask my teachers and my dad and, you know, but, um, yeah, so I, so I didn't do that, but yeah, I think people want experiences. And so even what we promote, like we have a new referral contest. We just launched it, uh, 12 days ago. So it's, it's literally brand new. Uh, we just finished one up two months ago and this is the new one. And it's a little bit of a, a play on the top gun theme. Um, and you know, is this good? I'm not going too far off track. No, okay. this is yeah. We go wherever you take me. You know. Okay. So yeah. Okay. So um, so what it is is, it, so I think people do referrals wrong. Let me start with this. Yeah. So most people, when they do referrals, they go, "What's the least amount of money I can give you to get that referral?" Right. So I want to give you. I'm a dentist. I want to give you 50 bucks to send me a new patient. Or it's like, are you, is that a joke? Like. I mean, you'd pay me 250 bucks as a marketer to get you a new patient. Why are you only paying 50 bucks to your 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 actual patient who refers into you, right? Right. So I, I think it's a joke, and in a lot of instances. 
So I said, how about a, if I do this? Referred customers usually are my best customers. They're the easiest people to buy. They usually spend more money and they usually stay longer. And anyone who refers typically stays with me longer too. They have a higher lifetime value. So I said, what's the most I can spend? How much is the most money I can spend? And so I calculated that out. And, and what I came up with was this. I can afford, if you send me one referral who becomes a customer, I can afford to take you to Las Vegas. We're gonna go into uh, acrobatic airplanes. We're, they ha they're set up with laser tag. and we're Laser gonna, tag? Yep, they're set up with laser tag. And we're gonna go up and do mock dog fighting over the Las Vegas desert. And, and I'm gonna try to maneuver behind you and shoot you out of the sky. And when I, hit, when, I, when I hit you with my lasers, smoke will come out of the back of your plane to know that I've scored a point and uh, it'll register it and then you'll try to maneuver and hit me and there'll be eight of us up there and we're gonna fly with a pilot and you'll actually get to take the stick and there'll wow. be a, a pilot in there with you and we're gonna go and we're gonna try to shoot each other out of the sky and it'll go in groups of eight until we get through everyone, right? We had, um, we just did an experience that just got over where we took them and raced like Ferraris and Lamborghinis and stuff, right? And, um, and it was great and so people had it all over Facebook and they were talking about it and, and yeah. you know, just, built all these relationships. We took them to dinner and did, you know, pay for their hotel. Like we, we, we gave them an experience. And so I said, what's the most I can spend? And then the Top Gun experience was actually a little bit more than my most, but I, I just, it was about 150 bucks more per person than I felt comfortable. But I learned a long time ago, if you're not feeling a little bit uncomfortable when you're putting something like this together, mm -hmm. you're probably not uh, trying hard enough. And so I said, okay, we're, we'll do it. And so that's our new, that's our new promotion, that. that, but, you know, for, People go out of their way to refer just to do oh, that experience. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I've got – so let me give you one that's a smaller scale for, for a dentist. Yeah. Because I just finished this promotion with them. Dentists are like, you can go up in this airplane and shoot down. <laughs> they, yeah. They just copy it. Like, yeah. ah, that doesn't quite work for years. Well, if they could afford that per customer, then that would be they great. Should. Right. right. But let's give them one that they can't afford. Um, so that there's a new version of this actually starting next month as well but the the one we just did for a dentist um it was a trip to disney world for a family of four airfare that's hotel. remarkable yeah great now they had to do it as a drawing it just you know i mean it's like a four thousand dollar prize right i mean they couldn't do it for everyone yeah they got in the seven months we ran the promotion they got 348 referrals wow a 348 most dentists don't see 348 new patients a year um, and that was just from one marketing campaign. Not everything they got, one marketing campaign, 348 new referrals. It ended up, they ended up with the cost per new patient after all the, all the marketing costs, right? Including, so we had some bonuses for the team, for their employees and stuff. Uh, $48 and change, I believe is what it was, per new patient. That's wild. It was cheap. It was dirt cheap, right? So it took me, here's the funny part. This particular dentist is actually, was my very first customer ever. Really? Yes. Wow. So you've been with me for six some odd years now, and it took me five years to convince him to do this. So um, now he may listen to you more often. Yes, uh, he usually does, and on this particular case, he wouldn't do it. So now the new the new prize he has coming up is a trip to Paris. Wow. This is going to keep getting bigger and bigger. It's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger, right? So, so are typically the referral partners other like specialty like orthodontists or, or are they actual patients or both? Those were vast majority were patients. Oh, patients. So, okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. So they've got a, they've got a decent sized practice. I mean, there's two doctors now. Yeah. I mean, when I met him, he was probably doing 200,000 bucks a year, you know, and, and between uh, his stuff and the stuff we worked with him on, I mean, you know, he's doing many millions of dollars yeah. a year, but um, um, yeah, no, he's, you know, but he's, he's, he's killing it. And, you know, they, I mean, he's he's given away a car. That was a great one that they did. They gave away a car one time. That was really good. So remarkable. Yeah. 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 Thanks for sharing that story. I love yeah. that. So, Sean, I, I have to ask about the balance. How do you, you know, with you have five kids, wife, yes. sixty employees, right? Yes. Um, can counting. How do you balance family? And I know there's no such thing as balance, but I'll ask you anyways. Uh, you know, the family stuff and the work stuff. I know as an entrepreneur, it, it never ends, it never has to end, but. No, it doesn't. A um, couple things. Uh, one, I do take four vacations a year, three of them with the kids uh, and, and the wife, and one of them I try to just make the wife and I. So and every now and again, I can combine a little bit of work into the beginning of the vacation, and then we can take the rest of it together, and that's okay. Um, 
So not usually with the kids. I try not to deal with the kids. Um, I do, um, you know, it's, it's about being present while you're there. You, as entrepreneurs, it's very difficult to even be there sometimes. So when you're there, just be present. Put your phone down. Mm -hmm. Actually have a conversation. I know it's really old school, um, but it's, it's, you know, that's one way. Um, now, personally, it's easier for me. I don't know if other entrepreneurs are this way. It's easier for me to balance the needs of my wife and the needs of my kids uh, and the business. The harder part sometimes is to balance my needs, right? Um, you know, where I just need some downtime. I just need a break. And, um, and that's, that I actually find more challenging than the other mm -hmm. side of it. And so the best I've come up with, and I'm actually doing it, um, I'm actually doing it while I'm in, a, in Arizona here, um, is that, uh, sometimes I'll just tack an extra day on and I go do something fun. Mm. And, uh, like there's a, um, like a range down here that I passed on my way in and uh, like a gun range and uh, they it looked like they have like full auto guns I've never fired a full auto gun that sounds like a really cool experience and again I'm a guy who likes experiences right so I'm like huh maybe I'll go down and do that maybe I won't maybe I'll just go see a movie you know I don't know but um, it's like Wonder Woman shooting automatic weapons I don't yeah, know yeah yeah I know Wonder Woman was good it was good but um, but yeah so I tried to do that and then um, you know, I go on a date night every week with my wife or every week I'm in town. Um, we, we pretty much go on a date night. Very rarely do we, do we miss that, but it, it happens every now and again, we have to miss it. But uh, I try to do that on Sunday nights. And, yeah. I mean, um, Sean, yeah. five kids sounds insane to me. What, like what's, uh, you five boys too. Yeah. All boys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What does that look like? With, I mean, do you have to just buy like five loaves of bread per meal? I mean, how, how does that even work? Yep, they do eat a lot. Uh, my grocery bill is insanity. It's, it's probably a couple fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars a month, I'm sure. So, and that's in Idaho, which is cheap. It's it's. I mean, so we will we do. I mean, we buy a cow, and they like we don't literally raise it, but then we buy one slaughter, and then we keep all the meat, right? right. You know, yeah. We really buy a whole cow like twice a year, <laughs> and uh, and um, yeah, we. I mean, we go through a ton of food, as you might imagine. The um. Back, you had a life-changing event occur at age 16. Yes. And I want you to just talk about that. Take me back to that. What was life like then? What what happened for people who don't know? Yeah, so it was, so it was crazy. Um, I get this phone call from my ex-girlfriend. I mean, we've been broken up like a good two months. So, I mean, obviously the first thing I thought when she was calling was, hey, she misses me. I mean, of course, that's why she'd be calling, right? And uh, which I get it. I get it. I mean, I, I understood. Um, but um, she was really calling to give me her good news. She had some good news. She wanted to share it with me. She was telling me that she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not the brightest guy. I mean, C minus student in English, right? I mean, I just, I, you know, wasn't that great. And, uh, and I said, well, that's great. I guess congratulations. Why are you telling me? And then she proceeds to tell me because the baby's yours. Wow. So, um, so I quickly realized um, that my job at Chuck E. Cheese wasn't going to cut it. Now, I had recently received a raise. I was now making four twenty-five an hour. Jeez. Yeah. So I, felt like I, I mean, you're 16. That's like, that's not bad money. So yeah, I felt like a baller, you know, right? right. So uh, back in like 1995 or something like that, right? You know, so, um, so, but I realized it wouldn't cut it. And, um, and I had to do something different. That's a and, shocking thing to hear. Out of was, blue. Yep. I was, yep. Especially because we'd been broken up. And, um, um, you know, and, and, and so, uh, you know, I just didn't, never, never would have guessed it in a million years. And then, uh, and, and her and I made a little bit of a go of it, tried to get the relationship going. And that didn't, that didn't end uh, up working out. And, um, and then slowly but surely uh, over the next, uh, you know, a couple of years, um, she just continued to kind of be involved less and less and less. And, uh, and so I ended up raising them, wow. um, with the help of my now wife, but, uh, I ended up raising him and, um, and yeah, he's, uh, works for me now. He's 21, uh, been, is married. Um, and, it seems uh, insurmountable at the time to me, like I know what it takes and I was much older and there's yeah. waking up in the middle of the night, there's changing diapers, there's. You know, that's a huge undertaking for someone who's kind of has someone with them helping and you're older and you're kind of wiser, let alone yep. when you're 16 or 17. 
Well, yeah, I mean, it, it was, and, and I was uh, on my own at 16, so I had moved out. I, I didn't, wow. you know, I wasn't living at home or anything. I didn't have parents to help me out, and um, um, so yeah, it was it was scary and it was hard. And how did it, you manage all that? And you didn't have. I mean, I can't even imagine that honestly, Sean. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, to be honest, the first thing I had to do, and um, and I ultimately went back, but I dropped out of high school. I didn't mm. have any choice. I, I needed a job, and I couldn't get a full-time job that paid well while I was going to school from right. eight, right? Yeah. And so I, I dropped out of high school and started uh, um, working for a, a regional electronics company called The Good Guys um, and found out very quickly that I was very good at sales because my very first month I made $5,000 in wow. commissions. Mm. And um, um, I mean, it was I think it was part sales, part my good looks, but, you know, I mean, we'll probably <laughs> sales. It all goes back um, to <laughs> so, so you know, uh, did that, um, and then went back and did um, like a home study learning, where I had a teacher would come to my my apartment um, like three times a week and, and teach me in between, like while I wasn't working and stuff, and um, and so did that, and um, um, ended up graduating high school, and um, but yeah, I mean, I, I had to go get a job, I had to make money, I needed health insurance, um, yeah. I needed. Um, I mean, in your mind, Sean, it seemed like, you know, this is it. Like, I am going to do this. I'm going to take responsibility for this. There wasn't any wavering there, it seems, you know? There was one, there was one point, and I'm ashamed of it uh, to this day even, and, and I'm um, happy that she didn't, uh, she didn't take me up on it. But we, her, her name's Rebecca, and is my son's mom, and we got into a big fight. And it was very early on after she had just told me and I was scared and didn't know what to do. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, I said, you know what, um, why don't you just go have an abortion? Let's just be done with this. And I get a phone call the next day. It says, you know, or a couple days later or whatever it was, uh, the abortion schedule for Friday. You'll never hear from me again. Wow. And I called her up on Thursday and begged her not to. So, and she decided not to. And so I've been That's very amazing. blessed with that. Wow. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it was that was my one, you know, my one point where I wavered, and um, yeah, I that that's wild. I mean, I just mean you decided like, okay, I'm dropping out of school. I'm gonna support this, ba you know, do what it takes to, to take care of this baby. Yeah, you know. Well, I mean, was, I I I've, I've just been uh, in my, my whole life. I've been a very big believer in. Um, you got to own, you got to own your, your, you got to own the wins. You got to own the, the, the mistakes, which is what everyone yeah. said he was, you know, right. And what everyone said, uh, I was not going to amount to anything, which really just fueled my entrepreneurial growth. Right. You know, and, um, you know, I, you know, so, um, yeah, I mean, but, but I was just always raised that like, listen, this is, you make your bed, you go lie in it. And, uh, yeah, uh, I made my bed. I lied in it, and the baby was coming. So right. I, needed, I needed to own that, and um, and and that was what I was going to do. So so he works in the company. He does. Yes. So what does he do? <laughs> so he works in uh, he works back in production, which is the fulfillment end of of it, like uh, getting the newsletters out. He mainly though doesn't get the newsletters out. He works on the list. So he does the list management, gets them clean, gets them scrubbed. Um, he does that. He helps. Um, you know, helps. We have a, a super. He has a, a a manager above him that helps lead, but he would definitely be you know one of the other go to people with if there's questions or, or challenges there. Um, um, you know, orders. You know, to make sure that they have all their supplies. He's in charge of all the ordering and supplies for that department and stuff like that. So yeah, he's getting ready to move over into marketing in the near future. The next uh, position we have open that fits his skill set. Um, he he actually I made him study a lot of marketing. Um, as a, as a kid, I'm he, sure. Yeah. He didn't like it at first, but he, he likes it now. And, and so he's, he actually has a, um, very good intellectual knowledge, you know, not a ton of day-to-day -day experience, but good intellectual knowledge. And so, uh, I'm going to help. Well, him he's been, you know, soaking up through osmosis through you all these uh, years. Yeah, he's got that. So, but yeah, so, so that'll be fun. That is remarkable, Sean. Thank you for sharing that. That's yeah. a tough story, but it's got a happy ending. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. so, what about your other sons? What are they into? Uh, football. So, so yeah. Now they're. Uh, Do you think any of them will? Have they been around the business too, like helping out? Yes, my 11-year-old uh, helps out. Like uh, sometimes we have stuff that needs to just be stamped. 
um, or hand inserted, and he will he will come down during the summer. He was just there a couple days ago while I was there, and he's hand inserting and stamping and and gets paid uh, eight bucks an hour, which I feel like is pretty good. I mean, I started at four, so I'm doubled, like, you, doubled you. <laughs> he is um, uh, he is just like so entrepreneurial. It's just in his DNA. really. Oh yeah, he will. He's only allowed to like solicit the people on our street. Uh, but he will walk up and down the street, and in the wintertime, he's selling them same people, knock on their doors, selling them snow shovel in their driveway. And in the summer, he's selling, uh, you know, to, to wash their cars. And he just, every new idea he has, he goes out and tries to sell it to every neighbor That's we good. have. Um, yeah, he made 200 bucks uh, one weekend snow shoveling this winter. Um, so, yeah, he's, he's, he's really into it. Um, um, my. Uh, uh, six, my seven year old, not so much. He's actually more like me, um, when I was a, as a kid, but he's not so into it. Uh, you know, the thing I worry about the kids is, is that they're, and I, I think a lot of entrepreneurs feel this way. They have such a cushy life compared to what I grew up with, um, that they don't fully get it. Right. I mean, I grew up very poor, super poor. And so I have this drive because I had nothing. He's like chip on your shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they have, you know, I mean, they don't, we don't buy them anything and everything they want, but comparatively speaking, they have everything, you know? I mean, it sounds like you were on your own from a very young age. Yeah, yeah, that was, um, I mean, the, sh the the really short version of that story is that um, I, my dad got orders to Mississippi. He was in the Air Force. I lasted all of one month in Mississippi. Uh, it was still actually pretty racially divided when I was there, and um I wasn't used to that from the Bay Area, and I, I miss my girlfriend, my son's mom. I miss my girlfriend, and, uh, and um, you know, I even had the, I even remember getting this little talking to one time because I was hanging out with this, this one black guy, um, and uh, they're like, well, you know, we kind of don't usually hang out with those guys, and I'm like, what do you mean those guys? <laughs> like, I don't understand, so I was just... You didn't I guess register. Just, yeah, you weren't used to that. The Bay Area, right, you know, and so... Um, <laughs> So anyway, I lasted I lasted one month before I I told my dad, hey, you need to send me back. I'm gonna go live with my mom. My mom was a civil servant, and um, um, and they 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 almost mean servant, uh, you know, back then. But um, she didn't. She made very little money, and it was uh, my mom and my little sister shared a room. My older sister, her husband, and their baby shared another room, and I slept in the living room on a blow up mattress um, for six months before I. I roughly turned 16 or so and uh and was like hey, I, I can't do this anymore and I, and I moved out so yeah so that was kind of the the you know how, how that kind of came about so sean it seems like though even though you're one of your sons he's very entrepreneurial he still has that drive he does he has that drive yeah one of them will uh uh one of them will have a probably a if he wants to a decent, uh, at least college run at, at, in athletics of some kind. Oh, really? Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, we do lots of in football In what games. sport? Football? Uh, whatever he wants. He, the kid's mm -hmm. like one of the most gifted kids. Uh, yeah, we do these uh, football camps and the coaches. We were just at Boise State which is and did a football camp. And um, his coaches were uh, some of the players. And so now he's, he's in kindergarten. Young kid, right? And the coach comes up and he's like, you – do you realize how talented he is? Do you realize how good he is at, at football being this young? And uh, when we play on teams, uh, like when we go to play on teams, they do a skill rating assessment, like so for the leagues and stuff. And so last year in kindergarten, they had him in, they had him playing with the third graders. So, cause his skill was third grade level, even though he's a kindergarten. So, wow. And, and the other That's kid, crazy. I don't know, he's too young. So we'll see what he ends up. But yeah, so uh, they're all different. It's really funny, you know, same, same mom, dad. To all very different kids, right? <laughs> Amazing. Sean, thank you so much. This has been awesome. Uh, and I want to point people towards where they should go. Um, one is newsletter, uh, newsletterpro.com. Any other places we should point people to go to check um, out what you guys have going on? I don't know if there's social media or is Newsletter Pro the best place? Yeah, newsletter pro is the best if they want, um, if they're interested, if they happen to be interested in newsletters, um, if they go to newsletter pro, like a special code, newsletter pro forward slash free book, that's a, a special code that will get them a free copy of one of my books on newsletter yes. marketing, including shipping. So we'll even cover the shipping at that. Nice. So yeah, that's really, truly free. Um, so they can check that out if they want. And then of course, all our links for social media, Facebook and all that's up there um, on newsletterpro.com. So yeah. 
Everyone should check out newsletterpro.com and newsletterpro.com slash free book. And the man knows a thing or two about marketing, selling millions and millions over the years um, of direct response marketing newsletters. So, Sean, I want to be the first one to thank you. This has been absolutely fantastic. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same right now.